My name is Dr. Stephen Greenspan. I'm a developmental psychologist specializing in uh, people with intellectual disabilities. I'm a retired professor emeritus of educational psychology at the University of Connecticut, and I have a clinical appointment at the University of uh, Colorado Medical School. When the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in 2002 in the Atkins versus Virginia case that it's no longer allowable to execute people with intellectual disability, I started getting asked to evaluate people and testify. Uh, if they have not yet been tried and, f and found guilty, the most typical way of doing this would be in a pretrial hearing. Uh, however, uh, even if the person is found not to have intellectual disability, they have the trial, the person is found guilty, it can usually be brought up again at, in what they call the punishment stage, but there it's uh, a mitigator, it's no longer an automatic exemption from the death penalty. And then of course in many cases there are people who are currently on death row, in some cases for a decade, two decades, and there uh, the issue was uh, if, the tr if the person uh, was convicted before 2002, before the Atkins decision, then they will have a, an Atkins hearing, but it will be held uh, at the habeas level before a judge. Now, what about the quality of this process? Um, is it, in your opinion, in your experience, uh, is it working or are there serious difficulties with it? Well, <clears throat> it depends, of course, in, uh, on how uh, much resources are available and the quality of the representation. For example, some of these cases are handled by the uh, Office of the Federal Public Defender. They have very experienced, competent attorneys. They have good experts. They have what they call mitigation specialists who do a good job of investigating. And they have a lot of resources, and those are usually very well done. In some places, uh, like for example in Texas, uh, these are usually handled by private attorneys who are appointed by the court limited uh, limited uh, funds, limited investigation, limited experience, and um, they're not paid that well, and, and here the process is not very good. Now even if you have a very good uh, attorney, even if you have very good investigators, even if you uh, uh, do everything the right way, uh, it's still an uphill battle. I would say probably on average maybe 25% at most of these cases are successful. What about the, the principles that are being used? Is there a, a scientific medical way of establishing whether someone is fit to stand a, a death penalty trial or not? For me, the issue that comes before me is not whether they're fit to stand trial, although sometimes that comes up because a significant percentage of people with intellectual disability are uh, probably not competent to stand trial or to assist in their defense. But rather the issue for me is whether they're eligible to be executed because of intellectual disability. Um, I mean, the scientific standards are fairly well developed, but not all experts uh, follow those standards because not all experts uh, really have a, a good familiarity with, with the field or what those standards are. Yes, uh, there are some experts who uh, seem to uh, have a, make a good living at testifying for the prosecution and always disputing intellectual disability. For the most part, these are people who I would say have very limited uh, training or, or expertise in intellectual dis disability. But the courts are usually very reluctant to say that an expert is not competent to, to testify. As long as they're licensed, they assume they can testify about anything they want to testify in. But intellectual disability is a specialized field. And uh, just uh, as I wouldn't expect a uh, general physician to be able to perform heart surgery, so too I wouldn't expect uh, an average psychologist or psychiatrist to testify about intellectual disability if they have not really been trained uh, in that field. Intellectual disability is sort of an artificial construct, the way it's applied. You know, we look at somebody's scores, uh, we take a very formal approach to it, and we lose sight of the individual. And there are probably two or three hundred 
or more causes of intellectual disability that I can go into, prenatal, chromosomal, head injuries, infections, whatever, not to mention severe deprivation. Um, but there are many, many other forms of brain-based impairment, autism, uh, traumatic brain injury in adulthood, but before a crime is committed, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, which we're beginning to understand is a very big problem in incarcerated populations, uh, and I could go on, uh, that where the IQ may be a little too high to call somebody intellectually disabled, but where they have the same kinds of problems of irrationality, impulsivity, failure to participate in their own defense, inability to appreciate risk. If you look at all the people who could be subject to uh, that kind of uh, problem, who are either on death row or facing a death row, and if you look at the irrationality of the process for determining it, the, imperfect, the, the imperfectness of that process, where it's almost an accident whether somebody gets relief or not, um, and it's hard to really feel that it's a good process, that it's properly administered, it would just be easier to just eliminate death row altogether. It would certainly save uh, the judicial system a tremendous amount of grief and, tr and trouble, and it would save the public a lot, of, uh, a lot of money. Not that I think money should be the main consideration.